today on the bench we've got this A672A synthesized signal generator which is a 2 to 18 gigahertz generator. I had this thing sitting on my floor here waiting for me to get to it for about 6 months, maybe a bit longer than that. Finally getting onto it, and now I know it's got some issues with capacitors. Because it came with these. There's some capacitors in here. Yeah, and it's also like a battery pack as well, which is interesting, it's like a memory backup thing which isn't installed and it's, yeah it's got some bits in here so we're not going to be powering it up we're going to be taking it apart apart like Dave says so we've got two screws here we've got to take out that will allow us to slide the covers off and reveal the goodness inside hopefully anyway slide the back a bit there's one cover there's some big caps in there I haven't got any of them <laughs> Some big ones. It's like a little cover goes over top. So there's also your main power supply over here and all that section. So, okay, it's actually not looking too bad. It's basically there's four big caps that's sitting right here. So there must be screwing types. I need to make notes of what these are so I can actually replace them and order in the right ones because I don't have them in stock. So, yeah, screwing types. Anyway, so it's got voltage references over here. So it tells you what the voltages are, where they are. Test points, you've got holes through here so you can see them all. So there you go. Tells you the test points, you've got holes here to line up to each test point so you can just sho shove your probe through. And it's got that, well, of course, everywhere. Those all test point marks. Brilliant, that's really nicely done. And it's only on this one board, the other two boards don't have that because they're the back backplanes. So I should probably just sit here and have a little look around and see if I can see anything which looks problematic or if I can see any burnt marks or anything which could be a problem which is obvious, but I don't think there is. So I think basically this thing here was working because when I purchased this, there were photos of it generating a signal. The person I got this from, I've forgotten his name now, it was so long ago, but he was actually really generous. He gave me some bits of test gear for free, basically, as well. I can't wish I remember his name. I did mention it previously, anyway. He showed this thing working, and he had actually swapped the capacitors out, which is why I've got a bag of caps there. One of those is one of the original ones. And he's done, obviously, substitutions and some other stuff there, trying to make it work, but... He also knew they had bad caps. He did tell me he had bad caps, so that's fine. But he had had it working, so I, I, it does appear to be functional. It's just these caps need replacing, so I need to find out what these spacings are. I mean, 5 volt filter cap, 20 volt filter cap, minus 40 volt filter cap, minus 10 volt filter cap, so the voltages are marked on here as well. All I need is the screwing type. I don't have the screwing type caps. All of my ones are always soldering. So I've got caps which will probably meet these ratings without any trouble at all. Have you ever got the right capacity? Don't know yet. I have to pull them out and have a look. Then I also have to look at what I can do to actually replace them because I think I can't do it right now because I'm going to have to get the right parts in. I mean, I do have soldering caps, but I don't like to solder in with a screwing type. I don't like to do that. I mean, I have done it in the past, but if I can get a screwing type and they're not too expensive, that's the other thing. If they're too expensive, then I will solder a cap in. I'll have to do some research on this, I think. We'll pull these ones out, I think, and have a look at them. See what we're getting. So let's do some in-circuit tests for this. Now, this hasn't been powered up for months, so there won't be any power in these. You can get more guarantee it. So let's just shove the probes on, check each one, see what they're looking like. So it says 0.46 ohms, 12,220 microfarad. One here. Point four ohms again for my thousand microfarad. And actually, I'm thinking that this one here having these different style for the screws because this is minus 40 volt supply, this one's all low voltage, so maybe that's been done for protection. So these can get some easily, but this one's obviously for protection only, so you don't accidentally touch 40 volt rail. So this one here, 0.65 ohms, 11,000 microfarad, and this one here. 38,000 microfarad, 0.58 ohms. Well, the ESRs aren't looking too bad, but the ESRs aren't horrendous, so they might actually be alright. Although one of them has already been changed, like one of them's already been taken out, haven't they? Let's have a look at that. So, the interesting thing is, it's got this bag of bits here. There's more capacitor there than I've got inside the unit. This one's leaked, as you actually see corrosion at the bottom of it. This one's actually gone bad, this is leaked. There's some gunk on there. So, yeah, that was actually definitely going. 13,025 volt. Let's quickly measure that one. 
14,000, 0.15 ohms. So ESR looks perfect, but it looks like it has been failing. So maybe the other ones are going the same way and actually are leaking slightly. So although they measure good, they probably aren't. I mean, ESR, sorry, the capacitance increased slightly on that one. So there's maybe, I mean, I don't know, you can expect like a, a tolerance, you know, 20%, it's not exactly uncommon. So it could be nothing, but. So with this older HP gear, this era, it's always beautifully constructed. You know, it's got these metal cans in here, everything's labelled, it's always really nice. They put so much attention to detail in what I did. And it's easy to work on, test points are labelled, all the cards are labelled, it's just really nicely done. You don't get this kind of detail and serviceability in mind in newer gear, you just don't get it. You know, everything's plug in, so if you need to take a card out to check it, you can unplug it and just do it. I mean, you just don't get that these days. It just doesn't have the same kind of level of uh, serviceability anymore. Yeah, I need to decide whether or not I'm replacing these, what I'm replacing them with. I mean, I've got capacitors that are suitable ratings, maybe not suitable capacitances. Well, what's the biggest one I've got here? I've got some 15,000s, 16 volt. That might do one of them. <laughs> They've got this is a 5 volt rail. Oh, that was a big one, that wasn't it? But yeah, I do have some high capacitance caps here. Not many of them, but I do have some. I've also got some in my storage as well. 15,000, 35 volt. But again, these are soldering type. I'd rather replace like for like if I can. So get some screwing types if they're not horrendously expensive, which they could be, especially at this kind of dimension. These are massive caps, so they could be quite expensive. Right, so I've got this capacitor here out, which is a 40 volt cap, which is off the 20 volt supply rail. It's measuring high in capacitance by about 40% or so. So this cap here is actually equivalent to this cap here, <laughs> interestingly. A bit of a difference in size, but let's do a leakage test on this and see what actually happens. So I've got my supply here set to 40 volts. This is a leakage test which I built uh, a few years back. Let's try it. It will slowly cut. It's a big cap, so it's going to take a while to charge it. Now what I can actually do is crank it up and produce more current to speed the process up. This is going to take a while. So let's leave it floating for a second there. It's, the voltage is sitting there. It's not dropping off hard. So let's put a higher voltage in there. Like that will that'll generate more current. And we'll charge it a little bit quicker. Just watch that voltage there. It's going to take a bit to charge this up. The idea is that when you get to a certain voltage, it will stabilise and then you better leave it on and it will just... We, the current should drop to almost nothing basically when you actually get a point where it's going to be stable. That's when you check the leakage. And this thing can't produce a particularly high current, so I'm just having to just try to force it to get there a bit quicker. I'm also trying to keep below that 40 volt limit. So we're halfway there in voltage, so I've let go, there you go, 19.8. Now, if I set this the same voltage here, you would see a stabilisation. So I'm just trying to see if it drops down much. You will get a little bit of drop, but not much. It's not leaking too badly, because otherwise the voltage would be dropping quite a bit. So, I'll come back once I've finished charging this up. Right, I'm just about ready to test this now. I've checked these capacitors, pulled them all out, checked them. Now, this original one that was over here leaked. There was some corrosion on the board just down there, so I cleaned it up. Put some solder over the top, because there was potentially a break in the track there. There was like a line on it. I don't know if it's corroded through or not, anyway, I've, I've soldered it up. And it's got the capacitors that it came with in here, they all test okay. And I've actually looked to see how much it's going to cost to replace these four capacitors. It's about $150. $150 for four capacitors. I'm not inclined to change them unless I need to. The other thing that came in this bag, with these bits in, was this battery pack, which goes in here. There's actually like a holder, which is corroded. Let me show you that. There is the location, there's the holder. And as you can see, it's a bit corroded in there. So that I need sorting out as well. I'm not too sure what that battery pack is for. It's probably some memory system on it or something. It's got some metal strips in here, which obviously what the connections in there go to, which really look bad. I might look at what I can do with this. These look like NICADs. I, I really don't know yet. I might have to pull the thing apart and have a look and try and figure out what it's supposed to be. Maybe look at diagrams. It'll probably show on there. But even the screws holding onto the casing here, they've got corrosion on as well, just from proximity being in there. So it's got a couple of wires come off and go to the circuit board, so I could actually potentially just take this holder out completely, forget this pack and replace it with a new one, and just go straight to the circuit board with it, a couple of pins, because it just like it's got some push pins on there. There you go, you can kind of see it in there. There's two pins there which go onto the circuit board, it looks like it comes in that pack. So that looks like that's where I'd have to put the connections to once I fix it. Well, let's do a smoke test on it, see if anything goes bang. Power switch is off, other switch is 
internal ALC, AM off, if deviation off, FM mode, RF output off. This is the first ever power up. I had this thing sitting here for six months. Haven't powered it up yet. It's the first time. Let's do it. So it's putting 27 watts in standby. We have an oven light on over here, which means it's got a ovenized oscillator in it. Not unsurprising. So we'll see what happens with that. I might just leave it sitting for a bit and see if that current over here drops down, which it should do once the ovenized oscillator warms up. So I might just leave it sitting for a little bit. I'm going to keep recording in case this magic smoke comes out, you never know. I don't actually know where the ovenized oscillator is in this thing. It's probably labelled in here somewhere. Still 26 watts. Oh, what I expect to happen is when this oven light goes out, I expect the current to drop. I mean, it may not be a big drop. It might be a really small drop. It may be almost nothing it drops by. It could just be literally a standby current. Don't know. But I just want to see what happens before I turn it on. One eternity later. Right, there we go. The power's dropped down at 18 watts and the oven indicator has gone off. So, cool, that's working. That's did exactly what I was hoping it would do. Obvious power drop when the oven is heated. That's a good sign. Okay, let's power it up. See how noisy the fan is. I don't know what this is doing. That seems to work. So I can actually check the output on this as well. Make sure it's actually doing what it's supposed to do. It looks like the bulb has gone over here maybe. Not sure. Those goes. That goes. Okay. So uh, there might be a bulb that's gone there. Live a lung cow. Okay, nice 110. That's over range, yep, okay. I've got no idea what I'm doing here. I've never used one of these. Aha, we have something. Okay. So it's doing something. And modulation is doing something. Just like again we might have well maybe it's dodgy switches. Dirty switches. Yep, okay. And deviation stuff. I think it just probably needs a bit of a clean up. But we got some level there that's rubbing on the front panel and needs fixing. How to use this that's I if I'll put level on cow because I've turned off. Well, it hasn't gone bang. That's a good sign. I'll keep recording just in case it does. So I need to check the output and actually see what's coming out of this thing. 2 gigahertz. Yeah, I can manage that. So in its on state it's doing 174 watts. I might think I'll just put the top cover on it just to make sure it's got the airflow where it needs to go. Of course if there's any magic smoke I won't be able to see it now. But I'm worried about the uh, airflow not being where it needs to be. It needs to be guided airflow so at least like that it will be uh, more like what it's supposed to be. I don't want anything getting hot we shouldn't be getting hot. Let's get this thing set up and I'll look at this on a special analyzer, I think. I'm going to turn the output on and increase it a little bit. Aha, I'm seeing it there. Great, I'm seeing a spike. Yep, that's just there. I can see minus 40 there. Okay. 10 is as high as it goes. Right, let's show you the spectrum analyzer. So you can see that big spike there. Let me do a measurement on it. Find out where that is. So that's 2.001 gigahertz at minus 11 dBm. I have a set of plus 10 dBm. Now I also have a 10 dB attenuator on the front end of the scope. So that should make this 0 dBm. So we're not sitting at that. If I wind the vernier up, at maximum we're getting 1.47 dBm. I'll see that so it's a zero on the meter on the front here. We're getting 0 0.8. So yes, let's use a vernier control to set it to zero on the meter. That is the dBm and that's fine. Okay, so let's do zero dBm. 
and we should be getting minus 10, we are basically. So minus 10, getting minus 20, minus 30, minus 40, minus 50, getting down to the noise there. Let's see what we can do about making this a bit better. I've got an automatic attenuator there of 20 dB, so that's dropping it down quite a bit. It's actually go manual, which is where things can be a bit risky. Manual, wind it down. careful about this, 0 dBm, 0 dB attenuator, but I've got a 10 dB on the outside so I've got some kind of protection there, so I'm stepping through, it's down minus 50 dB on the front panel of the meter here, let's just do another peak search, and we've got minus 60, because don't forget we've got a 10 dB attenuator on the front end, so, and that's also saying 1.9997 gigahertz, obviously if I get the span closer it'd be more accurate. But that's working. Okay, let's try changing the band or the frequencies a little bit here. Let's wind up a bit. It's 2.5 gigahertz. And amplitude, let's get the peak. Continuous peak, let's do that. And this is 2.5. And there's 3 gigahertz. Yep, that's measuring 3. That's great. And that's also looking consistent. 3.2 is as high as the special analyzer goes, and right there, yep, that's working fine. So, 2 gigahertz, 3.2 gigahertz, confirm working. I'm going to stop recording. What could possibly go wrong?